please join in the responsive call to worship printed in the bulletin. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. For the Lord our God is a great God, a God of glory and might. The Lord our God is a God of grace and mercy and steadfast love. With glad thanksgiving, we will sing praises to our God and King. You may be seated. With joyful and thankful hearts, let us seek the forgiving grace that is made available to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Eternal God, our ears have become dull to the sound of your voice, either because we do not expect to hear you calling or because we don't want to be called. Perhaps it is both. What we do know is that amid the clamor of earthly voices, we have failed to discern your still, small voice, summoning forth faithfulness in us. Forgive us, O oh God. Give us ears to hear you, hearts to receive you, and such boldness of faith to follow your high calling overcome our sluggish discipleship by the quickening spirit and use us in a way that will bring honor and glory to you and to your kingdom through your son our savior jesus christ amen Jesus Christ came to save sinners. 
He bore our sins that we might be alive to all that is good and true. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Thank you, Megan. You have a wonderful gift. Thank you. Welcome to this time of worship as we gather here today. We're grateful that you are here with us and hope all of you will sign the friendship pad as it's passed up and down the pew so that we can have a record of you being here with us, but most of all so you can know who it is worshiping alongside you this day. And if you're visiting with us and are in search of a church to call your own, I hope you'll talk with us about that and and give us the opportunity to invite you to perhaps make this your church home, a place for you to live out your discipleship to Jesus Christ. I hope you were with us this morning. Between the two services, a wonderful reception for Alan Margaret Edwards and Memorial Hall, a, a great, a wonderful food, and, and a great opportunity to, to give thanks for one who has given so much to us. And so that thank you to the Personnel Committee for making that reception possible. You see on the back of the bulletin the uh, calendar for the week's events. The church office is closed tomorrow in recognition of 
Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, birthday, but then from then on, Tuesday on, the schedule is uh, our typical schedule for the week. The Early Birds uh, features Wayne Campbell, who is one of the group who's just returned from New Orleans, our, our Katrina work crew. Some of them returned yesterday. We've got a, a few others on the road today, but we're glad to have them back. Uh, I talked to Carol Ann Mooring on the phone in the middle of the week, and two words that came to her mind to explain uh, their experience was that it was disgusting and fulfilling uh, at the same time. Um, oftentimes that defines some mission. Uh, it's hard to do, it's not necessarily pleasant to do, but it's fulfilling because God's work is being done, and so we're grateful for that team for representing us so well. Looking down in the calendar, you see the congregational meeting will be at the conclusion of this service next Sunday at the end of the 11 o'clock service. Uh, various matters of uh, importance to come before the congregation uh, next Sunday morning. Your Christian Education Committee asked that uh, this announcement be made that nursery workers for the Sunday school hour and the 11 o'clock worship service are needed. We need more volunteers to make sure our uh, babies and youngest children are cared for during those times. And you can uh, make yourself available to, to be a nursery worker by filling out one of the volunteer cards in the pew racks or by giving us a call in the church office. Uh, give us your name and number and somebody from the Christian Education Committee will be back in touch with you. This is a vitally important ministry of the church to keep the nursery so that uh, the children are well cared for and so that young parents can participate in church school and in worship knowing their children are being uh, well cared for. So if you're able to do that and if that appeals to you, please consider volunteering in that way. Uh, today is David Covington's birthday. It must be nice to have a birthday in a family that sings so well. Um, and so, uh, David, we give you our, our uh, good wishes. Some of you may have been lured into church this morning by the signs out on uh, Morgan and Salisbury Streets. That, According to the signs out front, the sermon title today is Loving Attentively. Uh, actually, if you look in your bulletin, the sermon title is Living Attentively. Um, so if your spouse or significant other drug you in here today to hear a sermon about loving attentively, you'll have to come back another time. Uh, we'll, I, I, can't pro I may address that at another time, but today... Uh, just for truth and advertising, it's a, it's a different title. And we're going with the one that's in the bulletin uh, today. But again, we're glad that you're here with us as we worship God this day. One thing Ed mentioned at the early service was that our speaker at Early Birds this Wednesday will be Wayne Campbell, who led that uh, mission trip to Katrina. And he will be inspired. As for disgusting, just listen to us sing happy birthday at Early Birds. And that's uh, the disgusting part there. Concerns and celebrations are mostly uh, celebratory this morning. I fractured Bob Inskeep. I'm doing a little better. I've got my cast on now. Some people have questioned my choice of colors, this beautiful <laughs> Duke blue. Would you have wanted me? They did have Carolina blue, but would you have wanted me to get that color and forever associate it with pain and suffering <laughs> and constant nagging? Uh, On the other health concerns, Marie Pulley went home from Rex this week, but they're probably going to bring her back just because she's so much fun to watch. Uh, R.D. McMillan has moved to Mayview, and they're going to keep him there, I'm sure, because he's uh, such a lovable guy. And Oh, and we have a new uh, grandchild in the uh, Eatman family, Caroline Claudia Smithson Nelson, known as Cece. She was born on the 9th to uh, her mom and daddy, Betty and Russ Nelson. And again, Betty is Gay and Woody Eatman's daughter, so a new granddaughter in the world. Let us come to God now in a time of prayer. Great God, your voice spoke creation into being. And your voice calls us into being what we were created to be. It's hard to hear sometimes in our world of noise with ears that we keep plugged up. 
but help us keep listening so we can hear correctly and then feel your presence within so we can respond like the prophet Samuel or the modern day prophet Martin Luther King Jr. who spoke a word to our time echoing the prophet Amos let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream Lord, you enabled us to hear the voices of those calling from the Gulf Coast for help in rebuilding their churches and their lives. And a cadre of our members responded with enthusiasm. And Lord, as we ordain the new spiritual leaders of our church, the deacons and elders later this hour, may we listen to their voices as they, hearing your Holy Spirit, envision new ways that we can serve our Lord with love, faith, and action called as partners in Christ's service. And this morning we pray for those who need to hear your voice, the voice of comfort and assurance, the voice of healing and hope, the voice of forgiveness and a second chance. And if that word needs to be spoken in my voice, Lord, send me. As we will all pray in a song later on, Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Oh, use me, Lord, use even me, just as you will, and when and where. Having heard the teaching of Jesus on how to pray, we lift our voices together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come down and join me on the steps, please. And while they're coming, I need to add one more announcement that was given to me between services and I failed to pass on to Ed. And that is um, that our middle school youth will meet at five o'clock today, it's in the bulletin, to go bowling and they need to bring $5. So just to lift that up for y'all. If you'll sit out front, then I'll be able to see you and your faces and talk with you. It's much easier to Listen to someone when, when you're looking at them, isn't it? I brought something with me today. Does anybody know what this is? It's a phone. There are all kinds of phones, aren't they? You know, there used to be phones that were actually connected in the wall. I don't know if anybody in here still has one with a long cord or not. Now we have a lot of portable phones, cell phones. Many of you may have made a phone call in a phone booth. Um, phones are very important, and especially like my cell phone is important to me because it enables me to stay in contact with my family, my children and my husband, and also with my church family in case there's a call that I need to respond to, maybe somebody's sick or in the hospital. So cell phones help us to stay in contact with one another, and all phones do. Um, it is important to stay in contact with one another. That way we can know what someone's feeling and what someone's needing and, and talk to them. It's also important to stay in touch with God. How do we stay in touch with God? We call on the telephone? No. Ed, do you have a phone in your office? No. Okay. <laughs> um, we, but we do talk to God how? Yes. By praying. We can talk to God, tell God what's bothering us, and, and we can listen because God does speak to us, not on a phone, but God does speak to us, sometimes through other people, sometimes in Sunday school when we 
um, hear the lesson or in church when we do different things. So God does speak to us, and, and God listens to us. Those are two important things that talking on the telephone remind us of. Um, when, we, when we are talking to God, sometimes people will say that God called them. Did um, You may have heard an adult say that sometimes. They don't mean that God called them on a phone, but they do mean that they heard God's word through other people or through a sermon or, or felt God calling them maybe by great need that they see in the world. Like we have people that just got back from going down to New Orleans to do hurricane relief work. And they felt called by God because maybe all that they had seen and heard about the great suffering that was there. Other people feel called to be elders and deacons, and we're going to ordain and install some elders and deacons. They feel that God is calling them to a special work in the church, and Sunday school teachers and circle leaders and musicians and um, choir and ministers and other leaders in the church um, in many different ways feel called by God to do the special work that God has called them to do. But God can call any of us, whatever age we are, and God calls us and has a special plan for us. So I want you to remember and to listen for God speaking to you through scripture or through other people or by a great need that's in our world. Let's thank God for the ability to talk with one another. Gracious God, we do thank you that we are able to talk with one another, to share our needs and our concerns, and we especially thank you that we can talk to you through prayer. Help us to listen to your word and for your word to each and every one of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Loving Father, gracious God, please open our hearts and our minds to the reading of your word. Father, help us to be like Samuel so that we will hear your calling each of us. And like Samuel, we will be quick to answer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. 1 through 20, I'm sorry. Hear now the word of God. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before. Samuel, Samuel. And as Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. 
Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expatiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now to the New Testament, to Paul's letter to the Colossians, the third chapter, beginning our reading at the 15th verse. Listen again to God's word for us. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, pour out your spirit upon us gathered here, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. They called it the Andy Griffith Show, but oftentimes you wanted to keep your eyes on Don Knotts because if you didn't, you'd miss something. And they called it Seinfeld, but lots of the time you wanted to keep your eye on George or Elaine or Kramer. They were not the title characters, but if you ignored them, you'd miss something. And they called it Gilligan's Island, but Gilligan wasn't the only one on the island. The other characters had a role to play too. Now before I give you the impression that I watch too much TV, I do have a point to make. And my point is that while title characters are important, sometimes the characters that are just a bit out of the limelight have something to say to us too. Sometimes the characters that provide the backdrop are doing more than providing a backdrop. Sometimes they make significant contributions to the story. A case in point is the story we read this morning in 1 Samuel. As you would expect in a book called 1 Samuel, the story is about Samuel. But a little background is helpful. Samuel is the son of Elkanah and Hannah. For a long time, it looked as if they were not going to be able to have children. Actually, Elkanah had children with other wives, but he and Hannah were childless. But it was Hannah's fervent prayer that she be given a son, and so she went to the temple and prayed. She prayed hard. She prayed that she'd be given a son, even made a deal with God. God, if you will give me a son, I will dedicate his life to you. I will dedicate him to the service of God. Well, her prayer was answered, and she and Elkanah were granted a son. And so she came to the temple again and said, The Lord has granted my petition, therefore I have devoted my son to the Lord as long as he lives. And before we know it, the young boy Samuel becomes an apprentice to Eli, the priest, serving there in the temple. Which brings us to our chapter We've already heard the story, but let me summarize it. It's late at night in the temple. Eli, the priest, 
has gone to bed. Samuel, still a young boy, is lying down in the temple when he heard his name being called. Now he assumed Eli was calling him, so he ran into the priest chambers and said, Here I am, what can I do for you? But Eli said he hadn't called him and sent Samuel back to bed. Now you might think that Samuel should have known this was God calling him, but he didn't. There's something that medical school students are taught that says, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. What that means is that when you're presented with particular symptoms, you're to think most of, first of all, of the most logical diagnosis before you move on to more exotic possibilities. Well, that's what's going on here. You hear the sound of a voice even in the temple. If you know the priest is in the next room, your first thought is that the priest is calling me, not God Almighty. But then it happens twice more. And finally, Eli realizes what's going on, and so he tells Samuel to go back to bed, and if you hear your name called again, say this, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. And that's what happened. Samuel heard his name again, and he began what would become a lifelong conversation with God. But Samuel soon learned that hearing from God can be a blessing and a burden. A blessing because you're hearing from God. A burden because sometimes God's word is heavy. And that was the case here. For God told Samuel that he was going to punish Eli the priest. God was going to punish Eli because Eli had not punished his own sons who were guilty of blasphemy and all sorts of degrading behavior. A preacher being punished for not being able to control preacher's kids. It's a tough message. But that was the message Samuel received from God late at night in the temple. And you can understand why Samuel was reluctant to take this message to Eli. You can understand why the apprentice priest did not want to go into the real priest and say, God just told me he's going to get you. Now this is what I was getting at when I suggested that sometimes we need to look beyond the title character and notice what, it, notice what is going on in the background. This story is clearly about Samuel, but the more I read it, the more impressed I am with Eli. Why? Because Eli was eager to hear God's word, even though he knew it might be a message of judgment. When Samuel was hesitant to tell Eli what God had told him, Eli said to him, don't you hide God's message from me. If you do, may God do to you more than he plans to do to me. And so Samuel told him, told him that God was going to stand in judgment upon Eli and Eli's house and there was nothing he could do to change God's mind. And Eli received this news with a strange serenity saying in effect, who am I to argue with God? This is a story about Samuel, but hidden in this story about Samuel is this story of Eli, a person of such faith, a priest who knew he wasn't perfect, but who yearned to hear from God. And here's what's remarkable to me. He believed that not hearing from God would be worse than hearing a harsh word from God. Do you understand what I mean? He believed that not hearing God's word was worse than hearing a harsh word from God. 
Eli was a person who understood that a life that is disconnected from God is an empty life. And so his chief hunger was to learn and to know God's will, even when he knew his own life would be judged as flawed. Not everybody is so open to the stern critique of God. In a recent book by Tom Long, he recounts an event back from the mid-1970s that I actually remember when Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the dissident from the Soviet Union, defected to the United States. And the, the people at Harvard University invited Solzhenitsyn to come deliver a commencement address. And, and American diplomats were thrilled at this for Solzhenitsyn to have such a public, public pulpit to be able to denounce what was going on in the Soviet Union and to lift up all the good that he saw in the United States. Instead, recalls Long, Solzhenitsyn caught the crowd off guard with a speech that denounced the moral decay and the spiritual poverty that he had already come to see in America. The folks gathering at Harvard that day were expected to be pat on, patted on the back and congratulated for the sort of intellectual and cultural progress that had come to define this country. Instead, Solzhenitsyn stood before them like an Old Testament prophet and offered a stinging critique at all the spiritual corruption that he had seen among us. As you might expect, he was roundly booed. Why? Because some people don't like to hear a word of judgment, even if it's true. Actually, we especially don't like to hear a word of judgment if it's true. And no one likes to hear a word of judgment when they were expecting to be applauded and affirmed. But that's what I admire about Eli. Eli was open to hearing God's word even when that word was a word of judgment. In this last week's First Press, I invited you to join with me during the next few months a discipline of daily Bible reading. Some people will and some people won't. Sometimes I think good church-going Christians are hesitant to engage in honest, serious Bible study because they know while God's Word can be a source of comfort and encouragement, it might also be a word of judgment against us. And so the temptation is to study only those parts of the Scripture that undergird what we already believe and confirm our view of God. Eli, on the other hand, was willing to hear the fullness of God's word because it was God's word. If it affirmed him, fine. If it judged him, fine. If it consoled him, fine. If it condemned him, fine. He knew what God had to say would be true. And he was open to receiving the truth. What I see more and more in our world are people who only want enough truth to support what they already think. Years ago, Dr. Walter Brueggemann was leading a Bible study in a church in Mississippi and he was taking them through a text that made them rethink some things that the congregation didn't want to rethink. And so at the end of the meeting, an angry man approached Dr. Brueggemann, challenging him for some of the things he said. And Dr. Brueggemann smiled and looked at him and said, well, I guess that's part of the Bible you don't like, huh? Well, that's the danger of Bible study. The danger of Bible study is it might confront us with parts of the Bible we don't like. It might introduce us to a God who acts in surprising ways and unsettling ways. But it might also shine new light on us. It might allow us to see things that we weren't inclined to see. It might help us to grow in our awareness that God is not just a larger version of ourselves. God is God. 
Eli, I admire Eli because he was willing to let God be God. And to hear a word from God even when it wasn't easy to hear. In Doris Kearns Goodwin's recent biography of Abraham Lincoln, maybe you've read it, I haven't. It's 944 pages. When would I have time to read a 944-page book? But Goodwin tells us that Lincoln did a most unusual thing when he formed his cabinet. He filled it with his political adversaries, people who often spoke out against him and who personally didn't like him. The book is entitled, A Team of Rivals. And maybe Lincoln did this because he heard the wisdom of keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Or maybe, maybe he did it so he would always hear competing ideas. He invited criticism and judgment, not because it's easy, but because he knew he wasn't perfect and he was willing to be shaped and guided by voices other than his own. That's what I see in Eli, and it's what I want to see in myself and in you. Hearts that are open to instruction, open to correction, open to having our minds changed, open to new insights, new truth, new life, but open, most importantly, to God. That's what I want for the officers that we will install today. I want them to lead this congregation not on the basis of their own inclinations and biases, but as they have been shaped and molded and corrected and chastened by the living God. And it's what I want for all of us. A willingness to plumb the depths of the scriptures, God's word to us, and to live our lives in light of that word. And mostly in the light of the living word. Jesus Christ. To him be glory, honor, and dominion now and forever. Amen.
a few minutes, the incoming officers will be saying their ordination vows. Let us say what in a sense are our vows as Christians as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. In the full assurance and confidence of faith, let us present our offerings and our tithes to God.
Gracious God, we thank you for blessing us so that we have gifts to give and for the learning that has taught us the joy of giving. May we continue to discern your will and hear your call as how best to invest our time, talent, and resources so that the cause we serve will not be our own, but yours. In Christ's name, amen. I'll fall down. We've come now to the order of service for the ordination and installation of officers. This brings to a culmination uh, almost a year's worth of activity. Last year, about this time, a nominating committee was being formed, and that committee worked for, for weeks and months to develop a slate of potential officers to come before the congregation. A congregational meeting was called for the purpose of electing those persons uh, to serve as elders or deacons. Uh, after their election, they entered into a time of preparation. Then they appeared before the session to be approved for, uh, for ordination and installation. And so this really is the culmination of almost a year's worth of prayerful, uh, activity on the part of committee, congregation, session, and these individual persons. I would like to ask them to come forward as I call their name, as I call their names. First, I'm going to ask those uh, uh, elders who have been installed, ordained before, who are coming today to be installed to come forward, and if they will come, uh, come to the top step. Uh, Susan Davis, Ed Finley, Ken Gwynn, David Kesterson, Don McCree, and Beth Wise. And then the elders who've been elected to serve but have, and who will be ordained today, Doug Kamen, Ken Kirby, and Carol O'Brien. And if our records are correct, we have one deacon who has been uh, ordained a deacon before and will be installed today, Jay Vick. And if Jay would come and take his place out also on the uh, top step. And the reason for this, y'all are not elevated above anyone else. You just don't have to come forward to kneel in just a moment. And uh, lest you think too highly of yourselves. Uh, and the uh, deacons to be ordained today, Amy Alford, David Allen, if y'all would come forward, Sherry Frederick, Christy J, Robert Lahr, Lewis Mayhew, Bob Morrison, Brock Nicholson, Joe Salisbury, Brian Van Voren, and Todd Woodard. As you would expect, Presbyterians have a method for doing this. We have constitutional questions that need to be answered. And these, these are, uh, you will hear a list of questions that all of you are to answer. And then at the very end of the list, there is a question specifically for elders and then one specifically for deacons. Your first test of office is to answer the right one. Uh, <laughs> but if you, uh, Bob and Sheila will lead us through the, those questions. 
Would you please answer these uh, constitutional questions? Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the Church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you. I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I do. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? I do. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world. I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? I will. And for the elders, will you be a faithful elder watching over the people providing for their worship, nurture, and service. Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ. I will. And at this time, the clerk of session has a question to ask to the congregation. Do we, the members of this church, accept these persons as elder and deacon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? And do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. If you do, please say, we will. We will. And at this time, those of you to be ordained, if you would step forward and uh, kneel, and if kneeling is an impossibility, uh, kneel in spirit. Um, <laughs> And now, anyone, uh, an ordained elder or minister of the word and sacrament, are invited to come forward and participate in the service of laying on of hands. You can come at this time. This is going to get a little close here in a minute. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord God of grace, you have called forth leaders in your community for as long as there has been a community. You have blessed them with your spirit, giving them strength and wisdom, discernment, and a high sense of calling. And we pray that you would give to these, your servants, those same gifts. We pray that you would surround them and sustain them, help them to use the gifts that you've given them, help them to discover gifts 
that are hidden from them. But if you have placed in them to be used for the glory of your name and for the work of this church, we thank you for the grand heritage of elders and deacons in this church who have served you so faithfully and well. We thank you for those here in this church and in the church triumphant who have given themselves with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. We thank you, O God, that we can now continue to serve you, to love you, and to seek to be guided by your Spirit as we guide the people of this congregation. Bless and keep each one, all those to be ordained and installed this day. Give them wisdom, energy, patience, courage, and a desire to serve you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for it is in his name that we gather and his name that we pray. Amen. Now you can stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are now elders and deacons in the Presbyterian Church USA and for this particular congregation. Serve the way Christ served. Served by placing yourselves on the altar of God, a living sacrifice, and let everything you do in word or deed be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God through him. May God bless you and keep you and use you, not for your glory, but for God's glory. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. What does it mean to live attentively? What it means to live attentively is to live your life wondering, will this be the day that God calls my name and sends me into some service? It might be today. It might be tomorrow. But to live attentively is to live with the expectation that God has something to do through you, through us. Have you ever heard your name called? Chances are you have. And maybe it scared you to death. Or maybe it sent you on a new road. But God is at work in the world and seeks to be at work in the world through people like us. People like Samuel and Eli. God knows our name and calls our name and has work for us to do. So live out your high calling in faithfulness and trust giving thanks to a God who claims us as his own. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessings of a triune God, be with you, with all those you love, and God's people everywhere, now and forever. Amen. Amen.